Our sermon series in Isaiah at all, it's kind of built around that famous verse of God asking Isaiah, um, whom shall I send and who will go for us in Isaiah 6, 8. So I always like to start these sermons with the idea that God is still asking this question, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who And, and I say that Isaiah answered the call and I pray that we're ready. God is calling every one of us in our realms of influence to sound out the message. To, to be ambassadors for Christ. There's always something we're to do. He, as I preached a long time ago in my Jeremiah series, that God wouldn't have you breathing unless He wanted you um, to be doing something. Amen. He's still got a plan, a purpose for your life, so let us find it perfectly in God's Word. But my message today is going to jump off of Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. What I call the greatest prophecy ever. We've talked a lot about prophecy. Jeremiah was a prophet. He always spoke of the coming judgment of Jerusalem. Isaiah has done a lot of that same prophecy, talking about coming judgment. But one of the greatest, the greatest prophecy, I believe, is what Isaiah introduces in his book, and that is the, the coming Savior. Right? Isaiah 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which we learned from Matthew, and we'll see that passage, means God with us. Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy was amazing for every reason you know. But at this point in time, it's amazing because, and if you look at the verse right before it said, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? God used prophets throughout time. And he still uses people to preach, but not prophecy has ceased. That's, that's done. But God used prophecy throughout time, throughout the Old Testament, to tell truths, right? And people wouldn't hear truths. They kept rejecting all the prophets, whatever they may be. And then, but God's ultimate sign of love was when he sent his very son to this earth. Um, the, he's not just a prophet, he's not a prophet, but God's very son, God manifests in the flesh, comes to earth. And we'll find out if people listen to him or not. I think my microphone's already dead, but it does not matter. It'll pick up just fine right here. Um, so let's talk about this. The greatest prophecy ever. The greatest prophecy ever. It was predicted, this is like 750 years before Christ comes. Okay? So this is well ahead in advance. And he says it's going to be, an, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay? This is, this is pretty, a deep prophecy, a far-fetched prophecy for those who heard it. But who was it? Please turn the page to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, in case we were wondering if Isaiah was prophesying whether this would just be a man, be a prophet, a good person. Isaiah prophesied that this is the child who would come. 9 verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. This is the God who would come. This is the Savior who would come. He would be all these things. Isaiah, just in, his, in this very book of Isaiah, it speaks to the deity of Christ, does it not? And it's an easy telltale sign of a cult. A cult is someone who denies the deity of Christ. It says Christ who, who wasn't what he said he was, wasn't what the Bible said he is. And those are, you, you can name them, you can name Jehovah Witnesses, you can name Mormons, you can name the secular humanists, whatever it is. People who say that Christ just came and he might have been a good person, had some good ideas, but that's just who he was. No, Christ was God manifest in the flesh. God sent Christ, God manifested in the flesh, to this earth to give a very vivid um, example of who He is and to pay the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. We're going to talk about that today. The sermon's simple, talking about when Christ came, this great prophecy that came. But I want to hit that and hit it hard because I absolutely our world gets it wrong. Christ, they say He isn't God. But Colossians 2, 9 says, For in Him, that is Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached in the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That's 1 Timothy 3.16 says that God was manifest in the flesh. 1 John 5.7 tells us, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Our minds sometimes can't 
you know, logically put together what three and one looks like, what the deity of Christ is, what the Trinity is. But Christian friend, we just stand on God's word. It says there's three and one, we believe it. it. says God was manifest in the flesh, we believe it. Someone the other day was knocking me, and they, say, they do this often. They'll say, you know, he's a King James only guy, King James only guy. And I don't even make that big a deal about it, although I do believe that God preserved his word in the King James. I believe it. I certainly believe it. I have friends. They'll use some other thing here and there. But I'll tell you one thing. One reason why I use the King James quite clearly is because it, it helps this whole argument of whether God or Christ is God or not. The deity of Christ is upheld in the King James. And this isn't my sermon this morning. This is, I don't want to go down too far down a rabbit trail. But most other versions in 1 Timothy 3.16, they say that he was manifest in the flesh. Even your American Standard Bible, even your English, uh, English Standard Version, some of those versions that you know, people know are pretty good people that use these Bibles, but those versions get it wrong. They say he was manifest in the flesh, which is ridiculous. That's saying like Mr. Maddox was manifest in the flesh. <laughs> We're all manifest in the flesh. But it's something to say that God was manifest in the flesh, in this earth. And it's something to say in 1 John 5, 7 that these three are one, which the, the, the new translations take that verse out completely. What am I saying? It's not just a rabbit trail. It's not just a hobby horse. I'm saying that this world wants us to say that Jesus is not God. That's what this world wants us to say. And sadly, a lot of Christians who may be well-intentioned are going along with it, especially with some of these new, watered-down, worthless versions we're using. I want to talk about this a little bit further, but let's go now to the New Testament the New Testament, and I want to look specifically at this prophecy and how it's fulfilled. Please look at Matthew chapter 1. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to move pretty swiftly today. Pretty swiftly today. Hey, Pat, could you do me a favor before you sit down? Can you turn me up a little bit so I don't have to eat the mic quite as, as heavily? I'm just, uh, this one's dead, so just the main mic will be fine. Okay, Matthew chapter 1. Verse 18. This is called Truth Baptist Church, right? And so Truth Baptist Church, we try to bring forward um, truth as much as we can. That's sounding, it should be that one right there in the center, Pat. Bring forth truth as much as we can. So sometimes you'll leave sermons saying that uh, Logan stepped on toes or Logan you know, hit me in an area that's, um, that was hard for me to handle. But hopefully what we do is we leave this building and we look at God's Word. And you, you filter out, that's something that was a personal idea of Logan's, so I won't really listen to it. But that was a verse that Logan shared, so I'll listen to it, okay? So that's the way we want to we wanna work in this church is truth is truth and let's stand on it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some things today that might be hard, might be hard. And I'm just saying that up front. Here in Matthew chapter 1, you see the prophecy being fulfilled. 118 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so Mary and Joseph are a spouse. They are spouse. It's like an espousal period. Um, it's like a betrothal period in the Jewish law. Um, they haven't come together yet, but he finds her with child. In 19, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Now, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, and this is Isaiah they're quoting, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. We stand on God's word. Jesus comes and it's God manifest in the flesh. 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her first son, and she called his name Jesus. It's neither here nor there, but I would just bring up for the sake of Bible study that when you see uh, that Joseph and Mary, Joseph was going to put away his wife from her, that was lawful according to Matthew chapter 5 and 19. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you can put someone away for the cause of fornication. That's sex before sins, or sex or relations before marriage, right? You get what I'm saying? That's the lawful grounds for putting someone away. But today, what has our world done? They've embraced and accepted and promoted every and every single reason for divorce among the married people. And no longer do we practice um, until death do us part. But God has put together, let not man put asunder. 
That's another rabbit trail. I'm not going to go down that, that path, but I just wanted to say that, that that's really what Matthew's talking about, a Jewish book when it talks about putting someone away for the cause of fornication. That's what it's talking about here. Joseph would have been justified in doing so because in that betrothal period, it looked like Mary had messed up, but we know she was a child of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 2, and this is where I may step on some toes, chapter 2 is actually um, the scene of the baby in the manger of Jesus Christ coming, birth in Bethlehem. We all know the story, right? And I'm just going to say, and I forgive me, I don't want to be mean or hostile, but I will say that this sermon, I could preach a full sermon today about Jesus being born in the manger, and it would be absolutely appropriate. I want to tell you that our world, just how it says that um, Jesus isn't God, our world today has got fixated with Jesus the baby in the manger. The baby in the manger. And we relegate Jesus the baby in the manger to December 25th, and that's when we talk about Christ, and that's when we talk, that's the only time we mention Christ, is that baby in the manger form. We talked about that weeks ago. And we don't talk about the life he lived, the things he preached, what he believed, and ultimately what he did on the cross. But I want to say this morning out of love, I want to say this morning out of love, that we could talk about Jesus' birth any day of the year. And we should talk about his whole life. We don't need to talk about December 25th. And I tell you out of love this morning that one of the worst days to talk about Jesus' birth is on December 25th. And I'm not going to judge you. And I'm not here to make enemies, especially all these new faces we have. We're trying to make friends. I'm not going to judge you in your liberty, but I just want to speak truth from God's word. December 25th throughout history has been the birthday of, of heathen gods. It ultimately goes back to Babylonian history when they set up Nimrod. Nimrod, as he was a Babylonian god, a god who supposedly was reincarnated himself, his birthday was December 25th. Okay, so it's a, very, it's a date rooted in, in pagan history. We can study this later on. I know some people may raise eyebrows, but I'm going to get to a specific point with it. December 25th has always been rooted in paganism. Nimrod, the worship underneath the evergreen tree, which was rebuked by in the book of Jeremiah, it was all about bringing gifts to this child, Nimrod. The Catholics, what the Catholics did, and I know in this room are a lot of Bible believers, a lot of people in this room would never go sit at a Catholic Mass. But I'm sorry, the Catholics are the ones who took that pagan date, December 25th, and turned it into a Christianized date, and they made it Christ Mass, or Christmas. Okay? I'm preaching this sermon a little ahead of time, ahead of the holiday season, so that it's not as awkward then. But I want to tell you that I'm not forcing you. You have Christian liberty. If you're going to judge one day over another, that's up to you. But I want to tell you what the world has done with Christ's birth. What the world has done with Christ's birth is tied it to about the most pagan thing they could in December 25th, the winter solstice. Do you know that it was pagan it was Catholic. And do you know, in this country, our founding fathers, they did not celebrate the day. Christmas was not celebrated in our nation until the late 1800s. It wasn't adopted. And even then, you won't find it in Baptist churches. Not the Baptists are the end-all, be-all, but you won't find it. All I'm saying is, you may look at me now like, Logan, you are really out there. Well, I'm, go back a couple hundred years, and I wouldn't be really out there. They called it, in the colonies, the pilgrims called it December 25th. They called it Satan's birthday. That wasn't me. It's in literature, okay? So I'm not, I'm not, I know it's a huge family moment. I know it's emotionally driven. I know it's when families get together, they have a good time. But I'm telling you, what our world did was that the Savior came to this world to die on the cross for our sins. And the, what the devil could do to detract from that, it says, let's equate it with false gods. Let's equate Christ with false gods like Nimrod. Let's put them all together. And doesn't our world do that today? They'll say, oh, there's so many false gods out there. You know, there's Jesus and there's Buddha. And you just take your pick. You put them, you put them all together. Jesus Christ is not a false god. He is the God. Amen. He is the God. We should scream it from the mountaintops. Jesus Christ is the God. And today, I want to look, now after I got past some of the, the, the hard stuff for Christians, well-meaning Christians, I understand. I want to look at Jesus Christ, the life that he lived. What can we learn from Jesus Christ's life? To do that, I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of John. And you could go anywhere in the Gospels, but John, in a few quick chapters, gives us a look at Jesus' life. Because I want to narrow down a few things this morning, hopefully we got, by God's grace and with God's help. The idea that Jesus is God the idea that Jesus just isn't one of many false gods, not whatsoever. And now I want to talk about the life that Jesus lived and the pattern that 
was shown through his life. Think about it. If we had God manifest in the flesh, then that is a life we should pattern our lives after. You know the saying, who's all heard the saying, what would Jesus do? You know, the WWJD. It's really kind of over, overused and cliched at this point and on so many keychains that it doesn't really matter any worth anything anymore. But what would Jesus do is actually a pretty profound question. It's a profound question. And it's, a, it's an especially helpful question if we go to the Word of God to look at what would Jesus do? How would he act? It's a, it's a destructive question when you say, what would Jesus do? And then you tie that question to how you just perceive what Jesus would be or who God is, right? But today, let's ask that question and let's look at Scripture. What would Jesus do? And he came to earth. If you look at John chapter 1, and there are some, is there any more, um, I don't want you to stand the whole time. If there's any more serv um, uh, nursing services down there, you're certainly welcome to take them, but I got gotcha. you. No problem. John chapter 1. I only want to say a few things from John chapter 1, and then the main servants, main points of the sermon will pick up in John chapter 2. John chapter 1, I would simply be remiss not to point out that John chapter 1 is a great passage on the deity of Christ. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We learn from John chapter 1, as in other places, that God, Jesus Christ, is actually the Creator. It says in verse 2, The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ was actually the Creator. Amen. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. People did not comprehend. They were willingly ignorant about who Christ was. And today, Christians, or so-called Christians, are still willingly ignorant. Take a little piece of Christ, but don't take all of his ministry. Today, let's look, at, let's look at more of the full scope of his ministry. I'll bring your attention to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Again, backing up the deity of Christ, God manifests in the flesh. But now on to my point. On to my point, would you please look at 1 John, or John, excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 35. John 1, 35. A fallacy in our world today when we ask what would Jesus do or what did, well, uh, what did, what did he do in Scripture, um, a big fallacy we have is that Jesus Christ doesn't want to uproot you from your life. He's not going to change who you are. The fallacy in our world today is that Jesus wants to just take you and just use exactly who you are, exactly where you are, and exactly with what you do. From John chapter 1, we'll see quickly, and I'm not going to read a bunch of it for the sake of time, but look at John, that uh, verse... 35, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him unto Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. I can stop reading there. The simple point is that when Jesus Christ came, when the Messiah came, he called disciples. And what did he call them? He called them to leave their places, their dwelling places, to leave their occupations. He even gave Peter a brand new name. He completely changed who they are. When God calls you, He's not calling you where you're at with who you are. He's calling you to be a new creature. He's calling you to be born again. Our world today marvels. In fact, they hold it against you that we've had people in this congregation born again and they'll say, man, you changed so much. You, your whole life went out 360. And we used to like who you were before. Well, that's what Christianity is supposed to look like. That's what Christianity is supposed to be. A new creature is a new creature. A new habitat. Last night, my wife wakes me up in the middle of the night and she says, there's something swimming in our kiddie pool. We have a little kid's pool outside, right? There's something swimming in our pool. And so I, I get out, I turn on the light, and I look out there, and there's three raccoons in our pool. And it's a little bit scary. The kids aren't going to swim there now anytime soon. Three raccoons are swimming in our swimming pool, okay? They're an entirely different creature, right? They live in an entirely different habitat, different place. Well, I want us to think about that. When Christ says he wants you to be a new creature, it means a new creature. 
He's going to have you change things in your life. You may be living in an entirely new habitat. He's, when He gives you a new birth, that means you've got an entirely new family. That blood family you had before no longer matters like it did. I'll, I'm going to preach that in a second, but you have a whole new habitat, new family, and ultimately a whole new calling. When you, when you are born again, Christ wants us to take up, our, uh, take up our cross and follow Him. It's life changing when you become the Savior and get saved. Our world's missed that. Our world today would say that Jesus doesn't want you to change anything. Jesus likes just who you are. In chapter 2, let me draw your attention to another thing I think the world gets wrong. In chapter 2, verse 3, it says, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, woman what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This is... I'm going to, from this one little point, I'm going to extrapolate into a lot larger point. But if you ever notice Jesus' relations with Mary, um, they're very matter of fact. In fact, Jesus tells us that. When, remember, Jesus, um, when his mother and his brother were coming to find Jesus, and he was busy preaching, Luke 8, 21 says, Jesus answered and said to them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. You know, people get caught up in Mariolatry, don't they? They worship Mary. And it's not right. Mary said, My soul doth magnify my Lord and my Savior. She, she needed a Savior just like you and I do. Good woman, but a sinner. We shouldn't be worshiping at our, at our feet as the Catholics would have us do. But Jesus made it real clear that even that, even that familial relationship with His mother did not matter. What trumped it was those who did God's will. For those who obey God's word. Our world today, when they ask, what would Jesus do? They'll say, Jesus would put family first. Jesus would put family first. I want, I want to tell you, we've preached it before, but the sooner that we as Christians realize who our real family is, that's when we can start taking up our cross. Until that point, when we don't understand our real family is, until that point, you know what we do with our lives? We treat our families as our cross. Our families become our cross. We don't understand that your family, your true family, is those who obey and hear the Word of God. That's your family. It says that in Matthew 10. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it as clear as I can. Matthew 10, 35 says, Jesus says, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. You know where many many, 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 many Christians stumble right out of the gate? Is they get saved. They trust Christ as their Savior. And they're called out of this world. They're called into a new family. But they never switch families. They never switch. They never take up the cross that is the Word of God and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They still are cumbered about with the weight and sin that does so easily beset them. They carry that cross of their family the rest of their life. They're still saying, I still got to please mom and dad. Still got to please my kids. Got to please my, my grandma and grandpa. They got to be proud of me. They got to love me. I got to fellowship with them. Family is so important. Family is so important. You submit to your family more than you submit to the Word of God. It's that peer pressure. I know it comes from a good place. The Bible does say to honor thy father and thy mother, right? But that does not mean live for your father and your mother. That does not mean to live for your children. These are hard sayings, but I'll tell you, one of the biggest stumbling blocks for Christians in their Christian walks is the family. The sooner you drop the cross of pleasing, submitting to, and glorifying your family, is the sooner you can pick up the cross that Christ would have for you. It's true. Jesus would never say, put your family first, but our world does that nonstop. And it's causing Christians to never fulfill God's will in their lives. In John chapter 2, look over here at verse 13, please. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and, the, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Another fallacy about Jesus Christ is we look at His life. As we look at what would Jesus do, 
The world would have you believe that Jesus Christ never got angry. The world would have you to believe that Jesus Christ just came to this earth and he just talked nice to people. And he was just, he just exuded that oozing of love, that eloquent speech of love. No, Jesus Christ came and he did express love. But we have to understand what the love was. The love that he had was that he despised evil. He despised sin and he gave the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate gift of love by dying on the cross for our sins. That was Christ's love. God is love and that was love when he died on the cross. But this is the life that Christ lived. There's a big difference. Our world today has exchanged the love that Christ showed on the cross, and that's true love. Greater love of knowing that the man give his life for his friends. That was true love. The world has exchanged that love and raving about and preaching and sharing that message with your friends and your loved ones. Those who say, stop talking to me, stop inviting me to church. We share it anyways. We say, you need the Savior. You need to, you need to partake in God's love. Instead, the world has taken that love and said, that's, that's out there. What we need is this love that we need to express. It's just this oozing of getting along and talking sweet to everybody and just have a nice tone and have a nice smile and give a nice handshake, give a nice hug. And that's the love that Christ would have shown. It's a shallow, shallow love. Amen. The Bible says love is to speak the truth. The Bible says love is to keep God's commandments. The Bible says open rebuke is better than secret love. These are truths that our world has missed. Our world is missed. We've traded the true love and sharing the Savior with zeal and with passion and with love. Speak the truth in love. And instead we said, you know what love is? Love is just to accept everything, embrace everything. Don't ever tell your family that, that there's a problem somewhere. Don't ever tell someone they need to go to church. That's a false love that our world, that Satan himself has duped us into believing. This is love when Jesus says, you've made my house a house of merchandise. It's a den of thieves. You've ruined my house, the very house of God. Love today would be telling that to a few churches. Churches that have taken God's word and they've just turned it into things. They've watered it down so much. They've twisted the scriptures so much to their own damnation that all they worry about is getting people in pews so they can tickle their ears. So they can build big congregations. Pad their own paychecks. They've made God's house a den of merchandise. If Jesus Christ were here, he'd be going into many a place of worship and overthrowing many a table. And what you would have, you'd have a lot of wishy-washy, lukewarm churches and church members like this. They would, they, they would say things like, um, blessed are the peace, peacemakers, Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'd take verses out of context. That's a verse from God's word. But would they level it against Christ? I think they would. That verse is leveled against all those who ever stood up against anything ever wrong. There is a time to be a peacemaker. There absolutely is, especially among brethren in fellowship and unity. You, 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 you strive for peace. You turn the other cheek with your enemies. There are times, but when Satan himself stands up and rears his ugly head and takes something holy and makes it blasphemous, makes it ungodly, Christians throughout all of Scripture stand up and speak the truth. And Jesus Christ himself stands up and overthrows the table of money changers. That's love. That's love. Wishy-washy Christians would say, blessed are the peacemakers. They take it out of context. They'd say, wisdom from above is first peaceable, gentle. That verse in the book of James has been leveled against any Christian who ever wanted to do what's right. It's a great verse. There's an absolute place for it in context in your life. The wisdom from above is first peaceful, gentle. But we have to understand the context and understand the context of Christ's life. The wisdom from above has been peaceable. These people have been told truth that they're truth that they're truth that they're truth. And now Jesus Christ is here and he said, you've made my house a den of thieves. Sometimes God will cause Christians to get fired up with righteous indignation, not in your own flesh, not in your own strength, but with righteous indignation from the Holy Spirit. The world will say Jesus wouldn't get angry. I'll tell you, let's look at God's pattern here. God does get angry. Look at, please go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. What would Jesus do? Our world's taken that saying and they've turned it into a watered down Jesus. They've turned it into something that's not even true. John chapter 4, look at verse 6, please. 
It says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith to him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Jesus is in a, a deep conversation with this woman at the well. And we've all heard this story, right? I want to tell you how it would play out um, with those who have a wrong perception of who Jesus is. So, so far she's asking about this living water. Is she not? She looks like she's seeking God a little bit, listening at least a little bit. It says here in verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this, of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus Christ is pointing her right towards eternal salvation. Tell him about what he can provide. Amen. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. I pause because at this point, in our minds, and even my fleshly inclinations, right at this point, old Baptist preacher Logan, I would have gone right to the woman, you know, if I didn't know better from Scripture, I would have gone right to the woman and said, you know, here's the prayer, say the prayer, here's the card, sign the card, show up at church, we'll baptize you, you're good to go. We got it, got it covered. Let's get you in there, count the number, I'll send off the missionary letter that says we're getting people saved, right? I'd rave about it a little bit. Well, what would Jesus do? This woman who's hearing about eternal life, what would Jesus do? He says, apparently, from what he said, let's watch it and then I'll comment. 16 says, Jesus saith unto her, go call thy husband and come up hither. Now, Jesus, what are you doing? She's right there. She's ready to hear about eternal salvation, isn't she? What, Jesus, what are you doing? Getting off track. You're going down a rabbit trail that's no good. You're distracting from people coming to the Savior. Jesus knows what he's doing. Watch this in verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Okay, this is a tough spot. Jesus said to her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidst thou truly. What did Jesus Christ do? I'm sorry, he brought up about the most awkward thing in the whole world, and that was this woman's sin. He found it needful to make sure she understood that she was a sinner. It was needful. We've preached it many times at this church. I think God absolutely would have us preach it many times more that preaching the Savior without preaching the fact that you're a sinner does no good. It leads to false professions of faith, and that's what fills our churches in our world today. Everyone who just signed up for Jesus because Jesus was going to fill their life, they never knew that Jesus needed to save their very soul. The pattern of what would Jesus do is Jesus would bring up sin. It's the most awkward thing in the whole world he could have brought up. This woman was apparently, she'd been married multiple times. She's living with a guy now. A whole, she said, he says, thou hast had five husbands, and the one you have now is not even your husband. She was living in adultery. Jesus would bring up sin. While the world would say Jesus wouldn't bring up sin, Jesus would just look past it all. Jesus would take the high road, and Jesus, Jesus would just look for what's good in us. No. Jesus Christ came to um, rebuke the world, sin, righteous judgment, as the Holy Ghost does. It says here, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Okay, so this woman comes back again. She kind of changes the subject a little bit because he's hit a little too close to home. So what does the woman say? The woman says, well, I'm really interested in worshiping God, okay? So that's cool, right? I'm worshiping God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to go to praise and worship church. And I'll just put my hands and I'll, I'll say back and forth and it'll be all good, right? Jesus comes back hard and heavy. He says, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. Stop the presses. Stop the presses. 
Jesus will bring up sin. Jesus will even tell people that they don't even know who they're worshiping. We need messages like this, like Jesus would preach today. Because is our world one of worship? It is. You look around, churches on every corner, they have huge worship services. That in length and in zeal and in passion, they'll put our worship service, you know, you know <laughs> it looks like nothing comparatively. Our world is a worshiping world. The problem is they worship, they know not what. Because we've lost track of who God is. We've lost track of who Christ is. It says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God wants people to worship Him. He absolutely does. But it's no good. It's no good if it's just in your spirit. It's no good if it's just in your flesh. It's no good if it's just in your truth. It's got to be in the truth of the Word of God. That's why Truth Baptist Church, to its detriment, I'm sure, we will be a church that stands on God's word and all the counsel of God. Even preaches the unpopular saying, even preaches the things that aren't the smooth things. Because what are we doing? If we pack this church full of people who are just here for the shallow truth, the non-truth, the truth that says you can stay the way you are and just stay the way you are as long as you want, we're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. We're just building something that glorifies ourselves. That truly, is it not? Is that, that truly is how churches grow if you think about it. You know, churches grow today leaps and bounds. I mean, you can still have growth. People can choose to do the right thing. They can, those who seek God. But how churches today grow and how there's great revival is by a minister telling you that your sin is actually okay here. In fact, across the street, the sign says, and sometimes I pick on that sign, the sign says, the Episcopal, the Episcopal Church accepts you as you are. That means your sin is just fine here. That's why churches grow. And people today, the members go around looking for that church that's going to say what they're doing is just fine. The church is never going to bring it up. What have we done? We've, we've exchanged a true relationship with Almighty God with something that just puffs up our own flesh because of pride and the sin that we're attached to so dearly. Yes, Jesus would get angry. Yes, Jesus would bring up sin. Now, in, in our last section here, I would have you turn back to John chapter 3, if you would. From John 1, 2, 3, and 4, you can see plenty about Jesus. And someone's going to say, well, Logan, go on in his life. We can, and we'll study it. Um, I absolutely recommend it. Study Jesus' life. Ask, what would Jesus do? Ask it sincerely, and you'll see a pattern that's different than what this world teaches. John chapter 3 is another example of Jesus witnessing to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and by the way, I should say, you know that woman at the well? She gets right. Amen. Jesus preaches on sin, preaches, says that she didn't, she doesn't know what she's worshiping. And the world would say, you know, Jesus, you just turned her off. You just, you just, you just beat her down so much, you just turned her off from the Bible. <laughs> you're, just, you're, you're scattering, not gathering. Jesus Christ knew how to reach people, and it was with the truth. Flat out truth. She gets right, she goes back in the town, and she starts telling people, this man told me everything I ever was. That was, a, that was a conversion, amen. Here in John chapter 3, Jesus witnesses again one-on-one. -on -one. How should we reach people? Let's look at Jesus' pattern. 3 verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I like Nicodemus' heart. Uh, at least he comes to God. He comes by night. He wants no one to see him, right? But I like at least the fact that he's seeking out God. And here he is. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I always like to point out that um, Nicodemus comes to God, and he comes to Jesus Christ here with all kind of credentials. He was a Pharisee. He was a, he was a man who had lived according to the law really well, right? I'm sure he was esteemed in that, in that community. He was someone who has had things on the ball, done a lot of good works. And when he gets to Jesus Christ, what does Jesus Christ say? He says, you've got to be born again. You got, I don't want anything that you've done in the past. I don't want any of the sin you've done in the past, and I don't want any of the works you've done in the past. I don't need any of it. Don't want any of it. Today, that's what people, when they come to the Savior, they've got to be willing to make that decision. That what they have done is sin. And the good things that they have done are filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. 
Jesus says you need to be reborn. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time to his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, which is talking about the physical birth and the spiritual birth, by the way. For those who get baptism and regeneration, all wrong. Six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where, where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. He's talking about a salvation here that's different than anything Nicodemus has ever considered. Not works-based whatsoever. It's grace-based, and it results in being filled with the Holy Spirit. Something you, you can't see like the wind, but you see the effect of it in someone's life. You see that all of a sudden their priorities have changed. All of a sudden their direction have changed. All of a sudden their friends have changed. All of a sudden everything about them is changing and rapidly. That's salvation. He says, Marvel not that you must be born again. Nicodemus answered in verse 9 and said unto him, How canst these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. You know what I believe Jesus is coming back at Nicodemus about is Jesus is saying, Hey, we gave prophets who spoke of these things. Spoke of the Holy Ghost coming. Spoke of the coming Messiah. He's saying, you, a master of Israel, you should have read the book of Isaiah that said that God would come and be manifest in the flesh. Didn't study their Bibles. Didn't believe their Bibles, I guess. So they twisted the scriptures to their own damnation. The very problem with our world and with, with Christians today has always been, within our churches has always been, we see God's word and we don't believe it. It's always been. We see God's word and we twist it to our own destruction. Today, as we brought forth the things of God's word, I pray that we don't do that. It says here, he says in verse 12, I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How should you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he, but he that came down from heaven, even as the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is a great gospel passage. And if I felt compelled to the Spirit now, I would, I would move forward with that great analogy of Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. But Christians know, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I wanted to come to this very familiar passage because this ties right into Isaiah. And this ties in truly what God's love is. This is why you can have a Jesus Christ who overthrows tables, who gets mad at sin, who rebukes, who reproves, but is still all about love. Because that's what his life's work was, right? And that's what a Christian, it's the same for a Christian. That's why you can have a Christian who follows the word of God that says reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's why a Christian can do those things, but still your life's work is pointing people to the love of Jesus Christ and the Savior, right? That's your, that's your life. That's your pattern. That's what you're pushing people to. So yeah, some days on those, uh, you use compassion on some. On others, you save with fear. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, as it tell us in the book of Jude. A Christian life is a full package, a full Christian ministry, a full representation of how Christ would live. What the world has battered and battered Christians down to be is to just be that false Jesus who only ever said nice things, who never brought up sin, who never brought up judgment. And that's why our world is lost and growing darker and darker and darker. People aren't saved. If they are saved, they get beat down to believe that Jesus Christ didn't stand for anything. He did. The Bible says, as we go on here to verse 17, For God sent not His Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The world will tell us that Jesus Christ didn't condemn anybody. He wouldn't condemn anybody. Well, in some ways it's true. What condemns you is your choice not to believe in Jesus Christ. That's condemning. In verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. That's why we share the message even more, even more fervently. And this is the condemnation that light is coming in the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Isaiah says this God with us is going to come. 
He's going to show us the way of truth. He's going to die a sacrifice for our sins, as it says in the Gospel of the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. But the world sees this light, and we reject it, choosing darkness over light. Because why? Because their deeds are evil. Their deeds are evil. So why don't we as a Christian, why don't we as churches, just continue to go along and say, hey, you know what, those deeds that you love so much, just, you can keep them. Stay in them. Stay in darkness. Stay in darkness and act like you've got a part of this light. Act like, you know, Jesus is filling you. No. Our world has got God all wrong, has got Jesus all wrong, has got God's word all wrong. And it's time for Christians to stand up and answer Isaiah's call. Answer just how Isaiah answered. Hear my Lord, send me. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. We understand that why Jesus was upset? Because there's a lot of hatred and blasphemy pointed right at God himself. People don't just reject God. People don't just um, say, Jesus isn't for me. Inside people's heart is a fervent hatred of Almighty God because they love sin. They love sin. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Someone seeking God, as I believe the Samaritan woman ended up doing, seeking God, and as Nicodemus, I believe he got saved as well because you see him then at the scene at the cross later on. They got saved because they finally just said, I'm going to believe the truth. I'm going to stop listening to this wicked world that taught me all these misconceptions about who Christ was and who God is. The world will tell you Jesus isn't God, he's just a man. The world will tell you Jesus isn't God, he's just one of the many made-up gods. The world will tell you, okay, maybe Jesus is God, but Jesus would never do that. We need to stop listening to the world. We need to listen to Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. We need to stop believing the world. We need to believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh. Jesus saith, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No one comes unto the Father but by me. It's a, it's a very abbreviated message on Christ's life. What he showed us when he was God, when he is God manifest in the flesh on this earth. But it's an important message for how to live. Maybe today we've looked at some aspects of Jesus that we haven't talked about before. But I say as we walk out the door, let's compare Scripture to Scripture and discern how to live in this life. And I'll tell you that we've got Jesus all wrong. I'll tell you we've got love all wrong. I'll close with just this thought. In Luke 1, 46 and 47, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. One day I'll preach a whole sermon on Mary, Lord willing. Because if there's ever anyone who would have struggled with the Savior, it would have been Mary, right? She was in a position of superiority, the mother. You know, Pride would have gotten away, right? How can I, this kid of mine, who I've raised, he's the Savior? We face that today as pride enters into people's hearts. And they'll say, how can I listen to the Word of God? How can, why do I need saved? We struggle with family members who will say, how can I listen to a son or a daughter? How can I listen to a younger brother or sister or even older? Truth is truth. The Bible says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I know, Lord, that your ways are not our ways, Lord, and I trust that your will was done in the sermon this morning. I know where there was a lot of directions we went. But Lord, I pray that people would still recognize truth is truth. We don't understand ultimately who God is, who the Savior was. Lord, we wouldn't detract from him because we know that those that abide not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So Lord, have us contend with that. Lord, have us contend with what Jesus would do in this world as people have made Jesus a pacifist who would never preach truth. And Lord, we know that's wrong. May we live as Jesus Christ lived. May you bless our day today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.